Right, I think we'll get underway. Good morning, everybody. My name's James Batley from the ANU's Department of Pacific Affairs, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on the domestic politics of climate change. As we get underway, let me acknowledge the traditional inhabitants of the lands on which we're meeting. In my case, the Ngunnawal, and pay our respects to their elders past and present. Uh, the Department of Pacific Affairs has hosted State of the Pacific conferences over a number of years now. Uh, since we are unable to host a face-to-face -face conference again this year, we're hosting a series of shorter online events, including this one, under the State of the Pacific banner. Uh, you can find details um, of all of our State of the Pacific events on the Department of Pacific Affairs website. So I hope you find today's event to be interesting, to be stimulating. And I'm going to now hand over to our chair for today's session, Elise Howard, who will introduce our topic and our speakers. So over to you, Elise. Thank you very much, James. And uh, welcome to everybody joining us today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm zooming in from Younger World Country and pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging, as well as the elders and the lands from which you are zooming in from today. So the session that we're having today is about the domestic politics of climate change in the Pacific. And the session today will share just a snapshot of the many social and political changes that are occurring within Pacific Island countries that are being driven by climate change. And when we say political in this session, we're talking about the small p political in terms of the negotiations, the compromises and choices that people are making in their everyday lives, as well as that chance to mobilise domestically to advocate for change. So as sea levels rise, as saltwater inundation affects crops and groundwater, as there are prolonged periods of drought, and as there is increased frequency and intensity of flooding events or cyclones, this has a number of social effects and communities are responding to this in different ways. But for the future, it raised a number of questions about what this will bring and how the changing environment will influence our societies. What changes will climate change drive in terms of leadership? And what does resilience really mean when you have to actually put that into practice? And are marginalised groups able to amplify their voices in domestic forums to speak out on the change that is needed? So our three speakers today will share with you some of the stories around this. Um, first up, we'll have Fremdam Shadrach, who is the Director of the Vanuatu Skills Partnership. In the middle, we have Ursula Rakova, who is the Executive Director of Tulele Pesa in uh, Bougainville. Unfortunately, today, Ursula, uh, it seems that the phone lines are down and we haven't been able to get through to her, but we did anticipate that this may be an issue. So we have a pre-recording of her today. And finally, we have Francis Namomo, who is the ecumenical animator for the Ecological Stewardship and Climate Justice Program at the Pacific Conference of Churches. So following the three presentations, we'll open the floor for questions. So please post them into the Q&A function. And please note that these proceedings are being recorded and will be made available on the, our department's website to the public. So firstly, it's a great pleasure to introduce Fremdam Shamrak, Shadrach, sorry, who is the Director of the Vanuatu Skills Partnership, which is a locally led initiative supported by the Australian Government that is influencing service delivery reform across Vanuatu. The partnership explicitly places good governance and environmental sustainability at the heart of its work and has been successful in building a political constituency and local coalitions to drive positive change. In the wake of Cyclone Herald, the Vanuatu Skills Partnership was called on heavily by government to assist in recovery efforts. And it provides an example of the effectiveness of local level state building that is based on trust building and relationships. So when you're ready, please take it away uh, from me. Okay, well, firstly, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this uh, 
needing to share our experience for the Vanuatu Skills Partnership. And my presentation will be based on the experience of the Vanuatu Skills Partnership and how we're translating environmental and disaster resilience policy goals into a locally led action. Uh, just to start off, uh, I would like to give us a background to my presentation, and this is to give us an idea of the, um, the Vanuatu National Policy, which is the People's Plan, and it has in that policy uh, explicitly has a strong focus on the um, environmental protection, adapt, uh, adaptation, resilience to climate change. And this is, uh, I would say, a, a significant milestone for, for the country. Uh, through the consultative process and even to elevate uh, environmental uh, uh, concerns at the center of the national policy. This is a, a, a milestone for the, for the country. So everything we do is centered and also focused around the national policy, which has a strong focus on that. So again, just a bit of background. There is recognition um, at the political level, uh, uh, at the highest level, about the importance of environmental sustainability and resilience. But again, while there is the recognition, there are no clear direction for implementation of those policy right down to the community level. And uh, also, when we look at the uh, our development journey, there are major issues in those uh, in the development journey because there is so many good policy. Uh, policy formulation uh, is not strongly carried to, to implementation and sometimes even in ways that are uh, contextually feasible and also have a broad-based understanding and ownership down at a, at a community level. Uh, there is also, uh, because of that, the results sometimes are ad hoc and even uncoordinated and resource um, uh, inefficient activity uh, Again, because of the access to mostly the capital, the reach of state is only limited outside, is limited outside of the national capital. And there are no strategic mobilization of resources to actually support the provincial level to realize the policy directives. So that is, those are just some background. And also historically, this has been perpetuated again by a lot of activities by donor that concentrated its presence and programs in the capital. Again, because it's easy access, everything sort of focuses on the, uh, on the capital uh, areas. There is also the lack of uh, state effectiveness. And sometimes I would say it's very much well reflected in, in, in disasters. Uh, and, and a good example is during Cyclone Pan. Cyclone Pan experience, again, after the cyclone, uh, there's this influx of international actors, again, with all good intention to help, but then it, it sort of causes the perception of dependence on outside support. So it doesn't help anyway. And that was a clear example of that, uh, the lack of effectiveness that is uh, uh, reflected in some of those uh, natural disasters. Now, and also I would like to give you also just a bit, there was also just a bit of a background on that is the, there was a research that was done, a study that was done by Osei Den, and it clearly identified that the most obvious and finished element of the state building in Vanuatu is the limited reach of the, the state outside of the capital. While we have six provincial government, they are under-resourced and largely unable to deliver services outside of the provincial headquarter. And also there is the fact that there is little coordination between different levels of government from the provincial level or even the area level, the provincial and even at the national level. And based on those background uh, and, uh, and then the Vanuatu Skills Partnership came in uh, as an initiative. And again, the Vanuatu Skills Partnership is a locally led initiative to achieve social uh, or to achieve improved social, economic and environmental outcomes through the factor of uh, the national skills. So we are using the skill system as the factor to, to reform uh, and improve service delivery within the social, economic, and environmental. Um, from its inception, and that happened just after that study that was done in 2017, based on that, uh, from its inception, it always has this vision, and it's 
it's been to extend and build the capacity of the decentralized state, and that is to improve that service delivery. And again, also it helps to include um, local level response to natural disasters, not only focusing during peacetime, but also looking at how we can uh, support those service delivery during a disaster. This is based on the premises that uh, if we want significant reform to take place, then we have to also consider the domestic politics. And uh, the, the Vanuatu Skills Partnership is based on the premises that no significant reform can take place without navigating the domestic political economy and also building in the local buy-in and that motivated coalition for action. So that is how the partnership started off and trying to build on that to help address some of these uh, uh, issues that I've raised in my previous uh, slide. Now, what do we do? Just to give us some uh, thoughts on that, establish, uh, when we started off, we established what we call the pilot skill centers in two provinces, and that is to demonstrate what effective local driven service delivery could look like in line with the national policy. Again, how do we work? We ensure at the very outset that uh, New Vanuatu were managing those centers, not outsiders. Of course, we acknowledge that we have outsiders coming in and they help to support, but then the, the local New Vanuatu help to reinforce that message of local sustainable development and also humanitarian concerns are local concerns and that it is just important that locals are actually taking the lead in responding to that. And also we ensure that those skill centers were not doers, but were progress. They're trying to match local identified skills demand and also looking at local skill supply and making sure that we respond to those demands that are well in line with the national policies. Again, uh, our work with the provincial government, again, it's not just coming in and doing something for them, but we see where there is local appetite for commitment, uh, for change, and also commitment for change. And again, there was clear um, prioritization of environmental sustainability in all the activities that we do in the different sectors that we work with. We ensure also that the governance of the skill center sat within the provincial government. And that's where the decision making body is. So it's not just sitting outside, it's not creating a parallel system, but it's sitting within the provincial government. The funds are dispersed in response to locally determined priorities and in line with the national policies. We also, again, when it comes to communication, we uh, explicitly frame and reinforce uh, and communicate all activities in terms of national policy implementation with the explicit reference again to the national uh, policy, which is the National Sustainable Development Plan. And we use our resources again as a support. We use those resources to try and build on those gaps, to fill those gaps, strengthen those linkages, how we can help improve coordination at the national, at the provincial level, making sure that there is that uh, connection in terms of service delivery. When it comes to reporting, we ensure that all reporting data collection used by the provincial government. It's not a partnership, it's the provincial government that reports to the national level agencies demonstrating what changes happen within the province. And also, it's about giving the government actors at the provincial and the national level the credit for result. Again, we are supporting their priorities. It's not about us, the partnership, but it's about them. So they're taking the credit for whatever results that we achieve and placing the building of coalition and building um, appetite for change at the heart of all our activities. So that is something that we focus our effort explicitly on. And again, politically savvy communication that celebrate and also feel pride in any achievement for those coalition at the provincial level. Again, we're trying to build that coalition with the planning implementation and even up to the achievement so that people feel pride in terms of uh, the achievements that are achieved in the provinces. Also valuing relationship is at the core of everything and also valuing the Melanesian values before everything else that we do. So that's how we do it. And also what did we achieve based on that? Starting off from two, two skill centers at the, at the start, that's now the, the spread of the skill centers. So those skill centers, as you can see, starting from the north to the south, we have uh, from two, now we have four skill centers, and um, there's only two provinces that are still there. And there is discussion happening about uh, with the government, again, with the commitment, then we will eventually look at moving to the other two skill centers, uh, sorry, the provinces. 
Now, what did we achieve? Again, as a result of that, those skill centers who started off as a project, they now become part of the government system, which staff employed under the National Public Service Commission. So eventually, the government is taking on board of that. Those skill center network expanded to two more provinces, now having two other provinces to complete the whole of uh, Vanuatu province. There is also increased understanding of what policy implementation looks like in locally meaningful ways as a result of actually building policing at the local level. And again, the local, uh, there is local ownership of all activities and results at the community and even at the national level. There is also that recognition of the partnership as a key coordination mechanism for provincial community uh, level for sustainable development planning and also service delivery. And examples of stories have shown that, and that's what the government has recognized. And there is also transformation, not only that, the transformation of provincial economies through the tourism sector, uh, the handicraft sector, the agriculture sector, and even the building construction, uh, and also the reinforced balance between the economic growth and also the protection of environment. Now, the demonstrated uh, expertise and local legitimacy in coordination leadership cross-sectoral relationship meant that the centers were now seen as the key local disaster response mechanism. And that was a good um, experience for the partnership during the wake of uh, Cyclone Hell. And the government recognized that, that uh, because of all the efforts that was built, uh, that was used to build the local leadership, it was seen as one of the key uh, local disaster response mechanism that the government works with during the, uh, the wake of Cyclone Harold. That's just a, a, a picture of some of the activities, just to give you a, a, an idea of what happened uh, that, that during the response activity. Uh, the key results, again, because of all these partnership and skills and the leadership uh, seconded uh, into locally established emergency operation, send a link to the skill center. So, you know, both are closest during the time. Again, it was a good opportunity to test those local leaders, and most of the skill center staff were mobilized to be part of the locally uh, uh, established emergency operations centers. Also, uh, the coordination mechanism and relationship developed in peacetime were also used to mobilize during that disaster time. And again, this includes engagement of local businesses, community members who were contracted to provide goods and services that were built, and those relationships were built during peacetime. Again, because of the network of skill centers across different provinces, food and material corridors were established between provinces through the skill center network and helps to provide uh, food and other materials to the provinces that were affected during cyclone. Again, training programs flexibly adapted to focus on reconstruction of the field environment. And again, it's focused on field pack better and also the food security. Subsequently, because of all those models, the partnership was mobilized to support the Ambai volcanic eruption recovery using the same model. And now we have a recovery office that helps to support the, the recovery of people of Ambai after the volcanic eruption. So the key implication to all this is that development activities that prioritize local leadership, and that's what we believe, and understanding the relationship, the motives and the incentives of local actors and power holders and the need for concrete results, and also coalition building and coordination, uh, local level identification of problems and solutions, and also positioning all activity under local policy frameworks and local covenants result in authentic local resilience in the face of any significant social, economic, and environmental challenges. So that's, that's the based on the experience of the partnership the key implications out of our experience is that if we really want authentic local resilience in the face of significant social, economic, and environmental challenges, then this is what we think we should prioritize in any development activities. Local leadership should be at the core, understanding of the relationship, coalition building, local level identification of problems and solution, and also making sure that all activities are linked to policy framework and the local uh, governance. And then we believe that we can achieve that real authentic local resilience in the face of any significant um, uh, challenge that we will be facing within our country. So that's, that's a brief uh, um, presentation from our experience. Thanks everyone for your uh, listening and uh, wishing you all the best. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation, uh, Fremi. 
And uh, what a fantastic illustration of um, when we talk about climate change, uh, the headline is often about the disasters and uh, the intense cyclones. But the, what you've illustrated there is how important all of the groundwork is to address good governance at local levels and build those local coalitions and the ownership to be ready and poised to be able to deal with times of crisis rather than just responding to times of crisis in times of crisis. So thank you so much uh, for sharing that. And um, we'll hold questions until um, our three speakers have presented. So now uh, we're going to have a pre-recorded presentation from Ursula Rakova. Um, it's a bit sad that she uh, we couldn't get through to her today, but I'm so glad that we have this recording so that you can still hear her story. So Ursula Rakova is the Executive Director of Tulele Pesa, an organisation which has been established to manage the relocation program for the 1700 Cataract Islanders who have been affected by rising sea levels and climate change. And under Ursula's leadership, women have played critical roles in the relocation. Ursula herself also plays an important role in sharing the lessons on the social and political implications for relocation um, of, for other sites of, across Bougainville that may experience displacement in the future. Ursula has been really active and an outspoken advocate for communities experiencing climate change and has undertaken significant work across the globe to raise awareness of the impacts of climate change. So I'm hoping we have her video ready to go and we can listen to the story of that. to resilience and adaptation, Catherine's input partnership. Uh, the reason why I have chosen this um, title for my presentation is because we, we the Catherine's community that have relocated to input, um, got relocated due to uh, climate, um, uh, climate change, um, impact and shoreline, especially shoreline erosion, uh, very strong storm surges, and uh, which, which has resulted in um, shortage of food on that ridge. And, um, but coming into the input, we, we have begun to build our resilience, and we have begun to um, adapt to the situation in inputs because of the, um, the customs and clean systems that exist on inputs, which are also existent on cartridge. So I, aligning ourselves with the families or the clean, clean in inputs has really begun to build these strong relationships amongst us. The relocated community and the uh, receiving the host community. And so uh, to me, the, the, the topic is really, the title is fitting for the, for the presentation that I am going to uh, present later uh, as I go through the slides. Um, my, my presentation will basically cover the, the, the reasons or the, the full context of why we have relocated, and then the idea, why, why have we relocated? What, what actually, um, uh, what is the idea behind us moving? What do we want to achieve for our, our um, coming generations? Um, and how we got relocated, the process we have followed in basically getting uh, relocated and then the next steps what do what what do we envisage for the future what is our goal um, and basically uh, looking at our vision of uh, Patrick's Islanders um, living culturally and sustainably wherever they wherever they are um, our next steps want to look at um, envisages or looks at how we want to 
perceive our future? What do we want to do? We, um, how do we want to decide our future for our next generation? So this is it. Um, this is basically covered in our in my next uh, presentation. So in our context, uh, basically I have looked at the future. I mean the past relocation programs um, that has involved the Catrach people. Uh, in 1984, between 1984 and 1990, uh, the then uh, North Solomon's provincial government allocated land for cartridge resettlement program due to food uh, shortage of food. Uh, it did not really allow the islanders to um, build uh, plantations where they could grow cash crops. They were only allowed to make gardens, but the, the Parcel of land where they relocated was never purchased by the provincial government. So in 1990, um, when the crisis came about, the, the islanders that have re resettled moved back to the island in fear of their lives for security purposes. And then in 1994, 1996, the chiefs from Hanahan in Buka. Um, went and um, tried to pick up the, their relatives on Patrick and uh, brought them to Anahan. But this, this situation or the, the practice did not last very long because the women and girls were sexually um, assaulted and harassed. And even the families who, who were resettled um, they actually worked as laborers for the families that brought them in. And so they, they would have best food, and the food will be sold in the market, but they never received the cash um, um, in return for, the, for their sweat and hard work. So the program also failed. Um, and so in 2000, so they had to return back to the island. And in 2005, chiefs and elders of Patrick's um, because they got tired of empty promises and lack of government uh, services, um, got together and, and said, we need it, we need, we need to establish an organization that basically can, can, can spearhead this um, without government interference. And, and so that, that was when we um, started to um, get things going to have our own organization established. And so uh, in 2007, Tulele Pesa got registered as an, as an organization for Patriots Islanders for basically to manage the relocation. In 2007, um, the Catholic Diocese of Bougainville gifted us 30 hectares of land. Um, for Catrach relocation, and, and this is what has been happening. Um, we grow food, and the surplus food, we try to bring back to the Catrach to feed it, um, not just our relatives, but everybody. But, you know, due to transportation problems, we can only bring so much, and it's not a lot of food that we grow, just a bit that we, we can bring back to the islands. So this is uh, the whole context of why Tulele Pesa was established. It was initiated and established the Patriots Islands. <clears throat> Our idea is that um, we, although we, we are moving because of what is happening, our values still stand. And so we we are relocating and we also understand that we need to sustain ourselves and we need tangible consequences um, of raising our financially so that we are stable through growing our own food and not depending on our on other people and also growing cash crops so that we can economically sustain ourselves. 
And in the event that we we have um, started to grow cocoa as um, as a main group that can sustain ourselves, we we established we also registered a company which we call Bougainville Coconut. It's a limited company, but we we have started this company so that we can export our dry cocoa beans overseas and and that we we can also experience what it feels like to bring in money from outside and to run our program as well. So this is why we have established um, Bougainville Coconut. And it's not just um, dealing with the relocated families, it's also extending ourselves further into the host community so that they feel part of this um, international market uh, also, they can also benefit from the international market. So we are also trying to um, to take into account our host community and, and how they feel towards us. With assimilation and integration, uh, we are learning to adapt to the culture of the host community as well as them um, understanding us and the way we live. Um, we have four clans on cartridge, even five main clans on cartridge, and these clans are also um, in tempo. So we, we try to, to build ourselves so that we, we understand them and they understand us. And when it's to do with feasting and ceremonies and things like that, we, we take part. And we align ourselves with our clans. Um, so like if um, if their families uh, that belong to the Eagle clan, uh, in temples, they, when they, they are ceremonies, they, they try to take part as well. Um, and when, um, when people die within uh, the host communities, and we know we've, um, we've come into contact with them, we understand them, we, we do take part in, in those kind of uh, fest, uh, fest, uh, feasting and festivities um, of the host communities. And also when, um, when there are activities involving school, health, community government, we, we do take part. Um, we, we've also been um, distributing food to one of the technical schools in, um, in inputs, uh, where we provide food, surplus food to the students um, so they can benefit as well. Um, when we have a lot of surplus food, we, we try to chatter about a, bit, um, a small, small ship, um, but it's not it's not a ship, it's a boat. It's a 20 foot uh, boat. And, but they can carry a lot of at least 300 tons um, weight. And so this is a lot of food that surplus um, in our food gardens. And so we, um, I think in June, we, we brought some food. Um, the money for the transport was um, donated by the Painters Association in Brisbane. And so we were able to, um, to charter this boat and we carried food for all the five islands on Patrick's. It wasn't a lot of food, but um, it's what we could bring. Um, it's what we could load on this boat. Um, so we are just do up the write up again. Yeah, and explain that. Um, and when we distributed the food, each of the adults got 11 bags. Uh, plenty of materials as well as um, consumable, edible uh, food stuff. Yes. Um, <coughs> this is just this is a picture of um, what happens when um, 
when we have visitors or we are invited to uh, take part in some of the cultural uh, ceremonies, um, we we go to school. We we have a community, but we are sharing our lifestyle with the host community. Um, so that um, when when we had a visit by. Um, we had a visit from the Caritas New Zealand um, because they provided lettering, a VIP lettering toilets to the community. We, in token of appreciation, we performed some items for them. So this is just a picture of what happened. Um, but in 2007, um, the story goes uh, that way. Um, and so um, Bishop, um, the previous, uh, the former bishop, he's deceased now. When he went to the cartridge for two weeks, what turned out was that instead of spending two weeks, he spent two um, a month on the island because the the waves, I mean, the sea started to pick up, the wind was picking up, and so he got stranded on the island. And, and the food he brought for two weeks lasted for two weeks, and so the the islanders had to, you know, donate food to him, whatever little food they had, they had to feed their bishop. And, and so when he saw it, he saw the dire situation on food shortages on the island, he came back and that was what triggered him um, as head of the Catholic uh, church in Bogenia to give four uh, Catholic plantations to us. Okay, <clears throat> I think that's, it for, from Ursula for now. Um, I, I kind of want to say thank you to her. <laughs> Hopefully she can feel it uh, wherever she is at the moment. Um, but it's such an important story, I think, that Ursula tells us in terms of um, what's really involved in a relocation and um, what wasn't covered in the presentation there, but that she did share when we were chatting about it was the amount of cultural exchange that took place in the lead up to the relocation. So that first relocation didn't go so well. Um, and so there was a lot to learn from that in terms of making sure the relationships were built. Um, but also um, the vision that Ursula has in creating an economic future for both the community relocating, but the community that they've relocated to and um, how she felt that if she provided the financial stability and that everybody could benefit from, um, then there would be peace where they moved to and that that was a really important part of the social integration as well. Um, so for our final speaker, I'm just going to introduce now Francis Namomo, who is the ecumenical animator for the Ecological Stewardship and Climate Justice Program at the Pacific Conference of Churches in Fiji. And since 2016, most of Francis's work has been around how churches can work alongside communities who have been relocated due to climate change. But it, just in the past couple of weeks, Francis has been facilitating a community process in parallel to the Glasgow climate negotiations to gauge community understandings of climate change, but also their understandings of how the global negotiation process should be working for them. So prior to this, Francis was involved in projects with the Adventist Development and Relief Agency, Fiji, in disaster management. And Francis has a keen interest in climate justice and disaster management in the context of Pacific resilience. So please take it away, Francis, when you're ready. Thank you, Alice. Bulvnaka, everyone. Um, let me just share my screen. I'm really glad that um, Ursula had presented earlier in the context of relocation in uh, in the Solomons or Catrick Island, because at one point um, the, the Pacific Conference of Churches was also involved. Uh, in terms of engaging our churches, engaging member churches um, to the plight of the communities at, uh, at that level. And I think 
um, you know, in the, in the context of relocation, this is really important for the Pacific region at least, and something that the Pacific Conference of Churches have been doing um, or highlighting uh, in a decade now, because uh, it is the last resort when it comes to adaptation, at least, uh, you know, um, according to our here in Fiji, according to the national um, relocation guideline, until we ex exhausted all adaptation plans, then uh, we will refer to relocation. Eh? Um, first of all, an introduction of the Pacific Conference of Churches, uh, PCC, uh, in short, uh, has we have 32 member churches around the region and nine national council of churches. We work uh, closely with our member churches um, and um, because they have a direct contact to the, the communities. Eh? In this case, um, because of the work that we've been doing uh, that specifically focuses on relocating um, communities or identifying communities that will be uh, in the next two, three, five years, maybe uh, they will be relocating. This is very important for us because the process is, needs to be engaging at least, um, having the communities planning and designing how this should work. Um, we work closely also with the provincial uh, government um, and the national government. And specifically, a lot of our work is through the accompaniment process for member churches and uh, right down to the communities, awareness raising, um, and the theological reflection is one of the key areas. As you may know, in the Pacific, a lot of our views or our engagement and decisions are based through the spirituality, the context around spirituality, and also our culture and tradition. This sort of drives maybe how we approach issues. And in this case, as I mentioned earlier, when um, Ursula was uh, sharing her experience and her in her presentation, how culture becomes an issue when it when we're talking about relocation, because um, in most of indigenous communities, people um, are an extension of their land and ocean. Uh, we have sacred totems, maybe sacred fish, sacred trees, sacred bird. How do we engage or how do we bring all this conversation when we're talking about relocation or when we're talking about climate justice? Eh? How do we um, provide a voice uh, 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 of maybe um, provide an avenue to address, which is often called in the, in the um, COP discussion as a non-economic loss and damage. How is that represented in that context eh? from the indigenous community? So this is how at least PCC have been engaging in that area. We were fortunate in 2004 when church leaders started talking about um, uh, climate change uh, based on uh, communities that have raised this issue to the church leaders. And so the first statement that came out from the churches was the Austin Thai Declaration. And since then, there have always been um, a vision or the, the word used often in the church, the discernment. Eh? If, we, if we don't do our part now, this is going to happen. So already in 2009, a modern declaration was um, an outcome statement by the church leaders already visualizing if we don't act, take actions now, our communities, especially Pacific Island uh, communities, are going to be displaced. So since then, um, the Pacific Conference of Churches have been engaged in this conversation. Our first uh, community, or at least the work that we've done, done in relocation was in 2000 with the uh, Vunindongolo community, um, and at the same time engaging with Catrat uh, Island uh, through with uh, Ursula. So this is what we know um, in the Pacific. Eh? We are at the front line of climate change and impacts. Studies have indicated that Solomon Islands have already lost five reef islands since the 1940s and will continue to uh, face this. And Fiji may lose 14% of its coastal lands by 2050. 
you know, at one point in the conversation of climate um, uh, justice or disasters, we often look to countries like Kiribati or Tuvalu to, you know, this is going to affect them and then it's probably going to be the sign for countries like Fiji, Vanuatu or the Solomon Islands, you know, to then make it uh, uh, take on its that cue. But the reality is it's not the size of the, the land, you know. It may be, even though Fiji has a bigger land mass than Tuvalu or Kiribati, but already our coastal communities are, are facing or are experiencing this, um, the impacts of climate change. Already in Fiji, we have three, four communities that have relocated because of climate change. Um, some have uh, some are partial relocation, while uh, one to, yeah, two, one is a full community relocation while the three other communities have, were a partial relocation, part of the communities have relocated. Now, that's the context of climate um, change. But when we talk about disaster, and since 2015, after Cyclone Pem, we've had frequent disasters, tropical, we have frequent category five, um, category four cyclones, and communities have to be displaced temporarily. Eh? How do you facilitate uh, that temporary um, movement because the existing structures or our um, um, current structures on the on the land are not um, built maybe um, to withstand this but you know since 2016 lessons have been learned and people are now preparing much better or preparing um, are now able and now triggered what when there's an announcement that we are going to be facing, there's a you know a cyclone category five on its way. I think um, uh, Fremden had all, had uh, um, expressed that really well eh, with the experience in Vanuatu, and I think from us too, in our work here in the Pacific Conference of Churches and through the work with the Vanuatu Christian Council, that was a big learning for us. How the Vanuatu Christian Council have taken on the response and being able to to at least share that learning to come to our member churches here in Fiji and other uh, countries around the region. We all know this, the impacts of climate change. I mean, there are slow um, um, events and the sudden ones. Huh? Um, sea level rise, changing weather patterns, super intense cyclones that a lot of our countries continuously face in one year we would have two um, three or four cyclones hitting at um, um, at one time um, heavy and erratic rainfall causing um, frequent flooding drought in some areas um, and warmer temperature while you know while putting this down i was i was thinking these are also trigger points for other social issues eh? other economic issues because while you know we're trying to facilitate, we're trying to adapt here. As we experience one um, issue, as we experience warmer temperature, the the impact would lead to coral bleaching in the ocean. If we're talking about the ocean, coral bleaching in the warmer water causes coral bleaching. Then you would have women going further out into the ocean because where they fish, the fish that they would fish for their meals, that they would breed along, you know, around the reef, have now you need to move out into a much um, uh, cooler temperature that the, the fish can adapt to. So this, you know, this current impacts that, you know, although slow um, um, events have already triggered other social impacts and uh, social uh, socioeconomic impacts for, for communities. I'd like to draw our attention to the work on relocation because that has been where most of our focus um, have been since 2009. The relocation of Wudindongoloa, um, partial relocation done in uh, Narikoso, um, and Do village. These are all happening in Fiji. Now, while we were focusing in Fiji, we were doing at the same time following up on what was happening in the Solomon Islands. If there were already there were already internal migration 
um, uh, not specifically based on climate change, but on other uh, other areas. Um, but at the same time, how do we bring this conversation of relocation to communities in the Solomon Islands, in Fiji, Kiribati, and Tuvalu? Relocation is of is often not received well because it's a very sensitive issue. We say I say this uh, because, as I've mentioned earlier, it's sensitive in the context of culture, of identity. People are rooted where they are born, where they live, where you know the village has been home to their ancestors, and telling them to relocate. Um, is like breaking, you know, separating a kid from their mother, uh, forcing, you know, that separation. And so for for us in that work, it it took seven years at least for the first relocation, the Wunidongolo community that's on the, the picture there, to happen. Because while there were uh, processes in place by the government, um, the communities themselves, um, you know, accepting what's happening. It was also a space for reflection for, you know, how do you incorporate the context of spirituality of that identity eh, to the Vanua in the relocation process? Is, you know, in the development, real, you know, if, if we're talking about development and in the relocation process, does it identify the cultural aspect of things? Or do we, you know, have to separate this and deal with a cultural aspect separately from the putting infrastructures in place, you know, just having a process, a guideline, getting people to move, all other psychological aspect, where do we address this? Eh? I guess because Bunidong Law was one of the first communities uh, to be relocated, there was a lot of learning as well from here. How do we account for um, the old site where our ancestors are buried, our umbilical cord are, you know, are, are buried. Um, how is this accounted for in the conversation of, um, uh, the, you know, the, the climate change talk? Um, when it's identified under the non-economic loss and damage, how do we really itemize this? That when we are um, we may put a value to housing and infrastructures that can be, you know, compensated to communities. But how do you compensate for this when there's no real value that you can um, add to this? Eh? As this becomes, this be, this is the identity of the community. I I wanted to highlight here the one of the um, from the plan relocation guideline um, that Fiji. Uh, the Fiji government had put together, how it was important. I think this is important because it centered the community as the, you know, where the, the, the focus is supposed to be instead of one of the, you know, the government or any other institution leading the, the relocation work, it must come down to the community. How the primary duty um, recognizing it has the primary duty and responsibility to provide minimum standard protection and assistance to people at risk of or affected by disasters and environmental change. The Fijian government intends to initiate planned relocation actions only when all other adaptation options as provided by the National Adaptation Plan are exhausted and only with the full, free, and informed consent and cooperation of communities at risk experiencing the process of relocation. I think um, this highlights why or the, the, the need of, you know, to center the, the conversation around communities affected, um, the need to highlight um, the fears of communities, because often, you know, we're going, we're, we're trying to find solution when really the, we have not heard from communities what would they um, choose, what, what, what are the fears of wanting to relocate, or what are the fears of trying to adopt this you know, new adaptation project that's being um, uh, introduced to them by either the government or other parties. So the free prior informed consent of communities is important. Understanding what this the context of uh, these different projects bring to them. Eh? And at the same time, what really is the need of communities rather than 
okay, maybe, you know, uh, an, an institution or our organization assuming this project might be good for the communities because we might bring the project in, but the sustainability or how the communities own the project becomes another figure, which is why in most cases, um, the sustainability of project becomes, uh, um, is not followed through because it's not probably not something that the communities um, need or has prioritized. So, you know, having that, um, this discussion of focus centered on communities is quite vital. I think Alice had mentioned um, this in her introduction. While COP was happening in the UK, in Glasgow, we were organizing a, a side event also in the Pacific. Um, I mean, not in the Pacific, in Fiji. We wanted to run this because we know there's been a lot of talks about climate um, um, the COP meetings. You know, Fiji was president of the COP in 2017 in Bonn. But how has this, this is the COP, the COP buzzword has been around Fiji for a long time, eh? since, I mean, since 2017. But how much of this, how much of what's happening at COP is understood by communities? That's another thing. Um, are the real voices of communities being raised out there? So before the COP26 side event, we had a we had a join a climate justice march, which was uh, organized a Saturday before the, the COP event, um, the two days uh, side event. But this march was not allowed for certain reason. We didn't have uh, the documentation to 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 have this march. But the march was clearly in support of our government and the Pacific uh, uh, representatives in Glasgow. However, our COP side event went ahead, but it was interesting what was coming from communities because while our government and maybe the Pacific as a whole had priorities going to COP, which is a collective priority, what was being shared from communities through our um, two days event was how do you link, you know, we are our policies, our policies is saying something else. Um, what we are being um, experiencing at community level, um, you know, license being given to extractive industries to come and mine our rivers or gravel extraction. What message, you know, the different messages that's happening out at the global platform and what's happening here locally. Yeah? And so there was opportunity to question um, there was a space, a, I would rather uh, say a safe space for communities to say, now I understand, okay, why it is important that we are represented at Glasgow, but how do we have a, our voice represented there? And especially when our priorities are not the same as probably what our governments are taking there. Um, this was quite interesting because for us, it was also a learning lesson to know how much have we, you know, the gaps that sometimes we are amplifying. It is important to be represented at those platforms uh, in the Pacific, uh, I mean, in the, at the global uh, forum. But how do we also um, elevate or amplify the same messages maybe translated, maybe in the simple language that the communities and normal people can understand. I think this for us was a learning le learning lesson. We did came out with a with a, uh, an outcome statement, which I would gladly like um, would share that later. But because the, the event was done in the local dialect, they were using the expressive um, ways you know, in the in the poetic form, in the stories, they were able to share this through a Talanoa. People, you know, were were a lack for for a lack of a better word, were loud. You know, were able to express themselves clearly. Were able to um, link what was happening at community level and how they understand what should be happening at the national, you know, national governments, and what our national government should be addressing at the COP twenty six. So, uh, in in short, I have a video that I thought you know would sum up the 
the discussion for of the two days that I hope would, you know, instead of trying to repeat or translate what the communities uh, were represented at the meeting, um, why not let's hear it from them, uh, some of the participants who had participated uh, at, the, at the event. Can I play the video, Danuj? As world leaders at COP politics have spoken, negotiated climate change financing deals, and struggled to agree on acceptable emission levels, Fijian communities gathered in Suva, Fiji's capital. Representatives from eight communities impacted by extractive industry and rising sea levels, these are the people whose lives are affected every day by climate change. But are their voices being heard at COP26? Absolutely not. I don't think the voices of the voiceless are being taken up by the Fiji government to, to Glasgow. We can do better than that. You have to take the people who are living in the affected areas, those people in Gorulu who are experiencing fossil the immediate effects of climate change. For two days, affected communities shared their experiences analyzed climate change issues, and decided on a collective plan of action, including a stronger voice at international level. And that means sending the right people to represent affected communities at meetings like COP26. This group was clear on who should speak for them. Among those at the COP26 side event organized by the Fiji Council of Churches, Pacific Conference of Churches, and Transcend Oceania were communities whose homes had been washed away by rising sea levels. The eight communities gathered in Suwa include three which have been displaced by climate change and five whose natural resources have been stripped through extractive industries. Yet the Pacific voices at COP26 do not reflect the reality these simple folk face. We cannot afford to go and explain them. something we are not really experiencing. The first element might all be uh, experiencing changing weather patterns, but if you bring it down, right down to the level of the immediate effects like sea level, level rise, you have to bring this to the worst thing in the series. Those people can live in the same side, those people in the world, those people in the Because they experience it first hand. You, you might go and explain on the idea, but you might just be feeling less than 2% of what they are really feeling. Thank you, Dandu. I think at the end of that video, um, as much um, as we struggle to, to connect the, the reality of communities in our national governments, um, the work of the church have always been to provide uh, space, um, you know, a, a theology of hope, a theology of hospitality. What does that look like and what that would look like? And if such spaces um, are available, there will always be a representation that we hope communities are, will have a voice uh, and also are the relevant stakeholders that there's um, a clear um, identification of who's um, leading uh, in, in that in that spaces of centered around communities more like. Thank you, Alice. Ah, thank you so much, Francis. Um, your uh, talk, I think um, you really hit on something there about how um, the discussions at Glasgow talk about things in terms of, <coughs> excuse me, non-economic loss and damage. But what that actually, uh, what's hidden behind these terms of non-economic, <coughs> excuse me, is um, absolutely a central part of um, people's lives and what makes people who they are and how they identify uh, 
with themselves and with others. So um, thank you for pointing that out. Um, but also, I think what you've both really touched on in your presentations is that disconnection between policy and what is actually happening at local levels. 